we are, you're having another essentials class today. Um, we've been in the lesson on salvation, and we're going to continue in that, and in particular, effectual calling, looking at chapter 10 of the 1689, which I trust you all have handy for Sunday school at Cornerstone. The focus is Romans 8.30. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So effectual calling, that's our focus. And and part of it is, uh, the reason to return to it is we, we sort of raised some questions last week and um, as I thought about those and just thought about, you know, the reality of, of this calling is um, this, this regeneration that the Christian experiences is no less momentous than your physical birth. You know, the fact that you were created for this life and then recreated, as it were, to a spiritual life. Talked a little bit about um, that wh- whether this is a conscious experience, this effectual calling. Um, and we're going to get into that, but it's the, the Burkhoff in particular draws a distinction between regeneration as a secret act of God that happens in your subconscious uh, as opposed to effectual calling which you experience consciously. We're going to consider whether that's a, a right way to look at it. But in this effectual calling, just to give a quick review, last week we, we dealt with some questions surrounding the effectual call. We considered for example, uh, God the Father's role in effectual calling. If you think about some of the verses that speak to God the Father's function here in Romans 8.29, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. So if so who's who's doing the predestining there, or predestinating, as some say? It's God the Father, predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. First um, Corinthians one nine, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of His Son. So again, it's in that God the Father is calling. Ephesians 1, 17 and 18, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And then 2 Timothy 1, 9, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. And so I made the point last week that, at least in my life as a Christian, I I focus more on God the Son um, than on God the Father. It's just part of the way I, I think and function as a Christian. Um, but these are these are helpful reminders to think about um, our intimate relationship with God the Father. We considered uh, last week also... Um, God's sovereignty in salvation and how it's not a result of anything in men, 
And that is primarily from section 2 of chapter 10. Um, so if you've got your 1689, chapter 10, section 2, this effectual call is of God's free and special grace alone, not on account of anything at all foreseen in man, it is not made because of any power or agency in the creature who is wholly passive in the matter. Man is dead and sins and trespasses until quickened and renewed by the Holy Spirit. By this, he is enabled to answer the call and to embrace the grace offered and conveyed by it. This enabling power is no less power than that which raised up Christ from the dead. If you look at the verses that are referenced in that section, 2 Timothy 1.9, who has saved us and Called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose. And Ephesians 2 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and not that of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Man is wholly passive in the matter. In 1 Corinthians 2 14, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Man is dead in sins and trespasses comes straight from Ephesians 2.5. Even when we were dead in trespasses, made alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Then the working of his power, Ephesians 1, 19 and 20. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. So part of this whole discussion of, of the order of salvation and, and effectual calling in, in particular is to um, emphasize the sovereignty of God and salvation. This is not this is not God responding to your repentance and faith by saving you. There are verses that kind of read that way, though. Um, I was reading um, one of the common, an Arminian commentary by Erickson, and it's just kind of, you know, we're such a part of the um, reformed um, culture that to see someone put it in writing and say, you know, you're regenerated by God after you repent and believe. It's just kind of stunning. Um, you know, it, it, it is as, it's, it, it's almost like um, the Catholic priest calling down God, you know, in the Eucharist and um, having him at your beck and call so that when you decide to repent and believe, he will respond but take some verses taken you know on their own apart from all of the rest of scripture make it almost sound that way acts sixteen thirty five. they said believe on the lord jesus and you will be saved so it makes it sound like you know you believe and then god saves you or Romans 10.9, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. There is a sense in which we have been saved, are being saved, and will be saved. But you can't take these verses alone and have a proper understanding of how God works in salvation. So last week we also talked about 
you know, uh, if you believe that you can simply call on God at any point and that he will respond by saving you, can you actually be saved? And um, I know it's when I first began to understand Reformed theology and the sovereignty of God and salvation, I looked at this and I thought, well, you know, how, how can anybody even be saved if they think that way? Of course, I had thought that way myself up until that point, and so I too quickly forgot. Um, but the reality is that they can arrive at the same place, which is to trust in Christ alone for their salvation. And so, as Brian put it last week, you know, um, you don't have to be a Calvinist to be saved. But another large category of the discussion last week was just how does this effectual call work? And that's what I really want to return to today. Now, how our understanding of this doctrine has developed over time and, and how it um, informs our evangelism and our even our assurance some of the issues we raised last week, does regeneration occur before or after the effectual call or simultaneously? Does it occur apart from the preached preaching of the word? Does the preaching of the word itself affect regeneration? Does the spirit regenerate someone independent from the word of God? Our, our confession, if you look at this, even just the table of contents, um, starting in chapter 8, it's, um, well, 10, effectual calling, justification, adoption, sanctification, saving faith, repentance and salvation, good works, perseverance, assurance. There is not a section titled Regeneration. Um, and so you know, if you look at, at, at the way that the, the in chapter 10, the first section, um, it says, Those whom God has predestined to life, he is pleased and has appointed and accepted time to effectually call by his word and spirit. So those are together, his word and spirit. Um, what we're going to look at today is that in, in the development of the order of salvation and the history, the way this has, has been dealt with by theologians, these, uh, they began to separate these things. They began to separate the working of the Spirit from the Word. And I think in the end what we should come to is a conclusion that those things should not be separated uh, and that the way that our confession characterizes them is right. But let's look, so let's look at some of the verses that are cited in this first um, part of chapter 10. What What is the basis for, for what we're, and some of these we've already talked about, but so, you know, that section begins to those, those whom God has predestined to life, he is pleased and is appointed and accepted time to effectually call. Well, that gets back to uh, Romans 8.30 itself. Um those whom he predestined, he also called. But there are other verses that, well, and just that speak to this call itself. Second um, Peter 1.10, Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fa fall. 
uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 9, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, Romans 1, 6, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. And 2 Timothy 1, 8 and 9, Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. So he is pleased and has appointed and accepted time to effectually call. Ephesians 1, 10 and 11 is one of the verses cited in this section. It says that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Those whom God has predestinated to life, he is pleased and has appointed and accepted time to effectually call. And then by his word and spirit, is the second phrase in this section, by his word and spirit, out of that state of sin and death, which they are in by nature, to grace and salvation by Jesus Christ. And the verses cited are Ephesians 2, 1 to 6. You he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Then the rest of that section, he enlightens their minds spiritually and savingly to understand the things of God. He takes away their heart of stone and gives them a heart of flesh. He renews their wills by his almighty power, causes them to desire and pursue that which is good, effectually draws them to Jesus Christ, yet in such a way that they come absolutely freely being made ruling by his grace. So, the Spirit and the Word are together here, Um, but they, they began to be sort of pulled apart um, we're going we're gonna to look at how that happened. There are a couple of books that give us uh, a lot of the history of, of this development of the order of salvation. One is uh, Sinclair Ferguson's The Holy Spirit. Uh, another one that I don't have with me is Calvin and the Reformed Tradition. Um, there's one that I, I, a Kindle book that I bought um, Michael Horton's Covenant and Salvation, Union with Christ. And then there are a couple of essays written by Derek Brown that tied some of this history together. So we're using material from those as well as um, you know, referencing the systematic theologies of Burkhoff, Raymond, Robert Raymond, and Grudem. So... Uh, Ferguson uh, um, gives us a little bit of the history of the thinking about how the doctrine of justification was a focus of the reformers. And it was, it was that way because 
they were responding to what had been developed by Catholic, by the Catholic Church. And um, Ferguson describes the Catholic, the Catholic understanding of justification that had developed in the dark ages, I guess you would say, was that your 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 justification your was based on on actually becoming righteous you had to become it wasn't that you were as we understand it accounted righteous but that you had to work to become righteous and that that process was facilitated in some ways by participating in the sacraments and, and so assurance was nearly, or it was impossible. You were a heretic if you believed that you could, you know, be assured of your salvation. But so Ferguson describes it this way. Um, medieval theology was largely committed to a process of, of justification and therefore placed great weight on the mode of preparation for grace. The process of prevenient grace moving the will to hate sin and desire justice or justification, the individual was disposed to receive habitual grace. Imperfect sorrow for sin, which lacked the qualities of perfected grief, was compensated for by means of the sacrament of penance. And penance thus became a regular feature in the ongoing process toward Justification. At the root of this lay the Augustinian notion that justification meant to be made righteous, not to be declared or counted or constituted righteous in God's sight. Gotta have my coffee. Um, so this was where. Luther's great insight, you know, comes from Romans, where he he, he understands that this is where this is not a, a an actual righteousness, but a, a an imputed righteousness, a righteousness that comes through faith. Um, and so, at the beginning of the early in the in the Reformation process. It's the 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 issue principally is is justification. How are we justified? And you know Ferguson's uh, history includes um, says thus much of the Reformation would lay special emphasis on the reversal of the medieval ordo salutis arguing that justification must be logically prior to sanctification and not confused with it. Speaking of Martin Luther, uh, Ferguson said, he, he now saw that Paul spoke not about his working for the attainment of righteousness, but about God's provision of it in the gospel. A powerful rethinking took place in his understanding of the Ordo Salutis, the order of salvation, and the text that he had misinterpreted by means of his Roman Ordo Salutis now instead became the open gate to paradise. That begins. So, so in response to this Roman Catholic, you've got to become righteous, and, and hopefully, maybe, by the time you die, You'll, you'll be sanctified enough to, you know, enter into heaven. But you can never be sure of it. So Luther changes that whole thing, and then Calvin builds on that. Uh, Calvin, um, in this history we're told, um, sought to frame the biblical doctrines of salvation in a way that highlighted the necessity of the joint work of the Word and the Spirit in applying the blessings of Christ's work to the individual instead of attributing those blessings to the sacraments of the church. 
So I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm reading a good bit here, but stick with me. So Ferguson continues, in the medieval church, the sacraments acted as milestones on the road to justification. Wherever Catholicism held sway, all the blessings of union with Christ were attributed to and mediated through instrumental causation of the sacramental system and especially the Mass and Eucharist. By contrast, in the Reformation teaching, it was emphasized that the Holy Spirit brought the individual directly into fellowship with Christ, of which fellowship and sacraments were seen as signs and seals. So that's where this, this beginning of, of dealing with the order of salvation um, begins. And then over time, it becomes the, the sort of accepted order becomes uh, effectual calling, then regeneration, which gives rise to faith, leading to justification and sanctification and finally glorification. And as I said last time, the, you know, it's, it's important not to think of these things as sequential in time, but as logical uh, progressions. And in fact, one of the dangers that you know Ferguson points to in his book is that he gets so wrapped up in the order that you forget the point, and the point is union with Christ. Um, but it's important to know <laughs> that um, your your justification doesn't is it results from your regeneration as opposed to regeneration coming. Um, in the process of justification. So there's a there's a period of time where this is just sort of blurred. This the relationship between effectual calling and regeneration and how these things happen and what order they happen in um, isn't really addressed very carefully. Um, but it starts out. It's it, in part, the problem is is the definition of terms. So some theologians will speak about regeneration, and they'll mean something completely different than another one. Um, Calvin uses the term regeneration differently from the way that we understand it today. Um, and, and Ferguson explains that. He says, particularly in the teaching of Calvin, the term regeneration was used to denote the renewal which the Spirit effects throughout the whole course of the Christian life. For him, it describes the same reality denoted by conversion and repentance, but viewed from a different perspective. So I'm not saying that Calvin's theology was wrong, but his use of the word regeneration was different than what we have today. And, you know, if you look, there's another book that um, Pastor Rick gave me that is too academic for me, um, frankly. Uh, it's, it's the Calvin and the Reformed tradition. Um, but he goes into much more detail in the early formulations of the order of salvation. And um, Pastor Rick was explaining to me that um, that you can see other theologians who use this term to mean different things, regeneration. But then we get to the 1800s, and um, you've got Charles Finney among others, wandering, you know, with doing his tent revivals. And, and <clears throat> he's really, he's, 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 he's like anti-Calvinist, really. That's, he's, he hates Calvinism. Um, and, I, I, you know, I was reading some of what he wrote about Calvinism, and he was just really bothered by the idea that, um, Anyone would need to sit around and wait until they were regenerated 
in order to repent and believe the gospel, <laughs> which is not exactly how we understand salvation as Calvinists. But, but, but because of his sort of um, hatred, I guess you would say, for, for the doctrine, you know, he preaches something completely different. He preaches that if you will repent and believe, then you will be regenerated. And so it is in the face of that um, growing, you know, doctrine, the popularity of that doctrine, you know, even today in this country is widespread. And I, I'm sure it's fair to say there are more Arminians than Calvinists in this country. But um, in response to that, the, some of the theologians in the 1800s start writing and, and getting deeper into, you know, just how does regeneration work? When does it happen? And in, in an effort to um, emphasize the sovereignty of God and salvation, they begin to talk about what is referred to as an inner principle um, and so, by the so there's, there's one guy named Charles Hodge, and this is how he starts describing um, regeneration. He says, "This regeneration is physical rather than moral in nature, which simply meant that it was not something that was offered or presented to the will and understanding, but an effectual operation upon both." Um, upon both the will and the understanding, that immediately imparted a new disposition or habitus. The point was to say that in regeneration, the spirit actually changes one's disposition so that the preaching of the gospel will be received rather than resisted. And so he begins, he begins to talk about this principle that the Spirit of God implants in a person so that when they hear the gospel, they will respond. And that's really the beginning of the separation that, that even is evident in Burkhoff's systematic theology, Robert Raymond's systematic theology, and it's not quite as clear, but even it seems to be that way in Grudem's systematic theology, where regeneration really happens before the effectual call. It's this principle that's implanted. Um, and now they're still all trying to underscore the sovereignty of God and salvation. Um, but Derek Brown, in his essay about this issue, and speaking of Hodge, he says... Um, Hodge, in his attempt to combat the idea that God grants regeneration upon one's acceptance of the gospel, argues for the Spirit's activity to occur apart from any mediation by the truth of the gospel. Thus, Hodge maintained that regeneration occurred subconsciously. Regeneration, subjectively considered, and as he's quoting Hodge, or viewed as an effect or change wrought in the soul is not an act. It is not a new purpose created by God or formed by the sender, sinner under his influence, nor is it any conscious exercise of any kind. It is something which lies lower than consciousness. And in the end, uh, what, what he's done is, is he's divorced regeneration from the word. Spirit is working independently and apart from the preaching of the word to cause someone to be able to respond to the word. Um, and, and so Brown continues, he says, um, um, Hodge's noble desire to preserve the doctrine of God's sovereignty and salvation may have unwittingly divorced the word and spirit in the application of the benefits of Christ's work to the believer. 
And he goes on to argue that um, this has borne unwelcome and pastorally unhelpful fruit. So I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. In the end, the division of these things could have the effect of causing the person who's considering whether they're regenerate, whether they're saved, um, to not look to Christ, but to look at whether this principle has been implanted in them. So maybe we'll return to that, getting a couple of puzzled looks. Um, So Hodge begins this thing. He separates regeneration from the effectual call. And then Burkhoff picks up the same idea. And so in Burkhoff, Burkhoff says that regeneration consists in the implanting of the principle of the new spiritual life in man and a radical change of the governing disposition of the soul, which, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, gives birth to a life that moves in a Godward direction. So this implanting of the principle of the new spiritual man, um, this regeneration is not necessarily connected to preaching the gospel with Burkhoff or with Raymond. Raymond, so Burkhoff's writing in the early 1900s, Raymond's writing in, I think, the 70s. I grew him as, as more recent. Um, but so there's this, so, so Burkhoff introduces this idea of the creative word. So this is, this is, um, not the preached word. The, the, this is how um, Brown describes it. He says, Burkhoff argues that regeneration falls prior to and should be considered distinct from the effectual call in the Ordo Salutis. According to Burkhoff, the application of salvation comes to an individual first through the external call of the gospel, then by a creative word, not the word preached in the external call of the gospel, God generates new life, changing the inner disposition of the soul, illuminating the mind, rousing the feelings, renewing the will. This is regeneration in the strictest sense. So the external call. So that's not necessarily the... the um, Burkhoff distinguishes between external and effectual and... and um, the effectual call comes uh, as an internal call through the external call. Um, The point of Burkhoff is that there's this separate creative word that's at work apart from the preaching of the gospel, which is not helpful. Um, And... In Brown's essay, he goes on to show how this idea is picked up by um, you know, other theologians after Burkhoff. So it goes Hodge to Burkhoff to Raymond and to others. Um, Burkhoff desires to... He, he, he doesn't say that the, the preaching of the gospel is, is completely disconnected, but he, he, calls, he calls it just instrumental. Um, so in in response to you know that line of thinking um, Michael Horton has more recently written a book in which he he proposes that this separation is is wrong that um they should be regeneration is a real thing. It's, he's not saying that it, it doesn't happen, but that it is within and part of the effectual call. That these things are really synonymous, and, I, and that I believe is the really the understanding that our confession represents. 
and um, find my outline here. Got too many notes. So, so Horton, uh, Michael Horton argues, um, positing a distinction between regeneration and effectual calling also fixed a gap between the Word of God and the Spirit of God in the application of salvation to the individual. Although theologians like Burkhoff wanted to retain the notion of God's powerful speaking in the work of regeneration, the creative word spoken by God in regeneration was not the word of the gospel, but a secret word spoken to the individual below the level of consciousness, enabling him to respond to the effectual call. Thus, although the Spirit's work in regeneration was not strictly divorced from God's speaking activity, it appears that this speaking activity at the point of regeneration is not related to the external word of the gospel. And then what you have is the Spirit is found working apart from the revealed word of the gospel. And I didn't read all of what B.B. Warfield said about this, but um, apparently he disagreed with this separation because he says the Spirit's work in regeneration ends up being mediated by nothing. Um, so Horton's argument is that we should understand the word's role in regeneration as providing not only the content of the gospel, but also the production of the desired effect of this content, namely the creation of new life which turns the individual to embrace the gospel. And if you look at James 1.18. Well, let's start in 16. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Brought us forth by the word of truth, um, look at First Peter one twenty Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. Now, <laughs> I went back after reading Derek Brown's essay and the things in Ferguson's book and some of these others, and I looked again at Burkhoff's arguments, and he, he addresses these two verses and argues that um, neither one prove conclusively that the word mediates generation, or regeneration. And he's got this, I think, sort of convoluted argument that um, these refer to actual birth, not regeneration. Um by arguing this way, Burkhoff is able to maintain the distinction between the spirit implanting a new principle and the word bringing about regeneration in a broader sense. The idea that 1 Peter 1 20, uh, 123 refers to the new birth here is favored by the fact that the readers are represented as having been born again out of a seed that was evidently 
already implanted in the soul. It is not necessary to identify the seed with the word. Well, of course it is. It is necessary to identify the seed with the word. And that is uh, Derek Brown's point and Michael Horton's point. And so, you know, in the end, what we have is that God brings new life into existence, not apart from his word, but by his word. And that this is, um, what is the, what is, what is the sort of the fallout that we have from, from separating those things? Um, but one is that, um, forget, you, you get all wrapped up in, in, in these details and, and forget that the bigger picture is really union with Christ. Um, but furthermore, maintaining this distinction between regeneration and effectual calling actually undermines a Christ-centered approach to the Ordo Salutis and in turn weakens our doctrine of assurance and opens the door to other unhealthy tendencies in the Christian life. Um, Instead of being encouraged to turn outward to the content of the effectual call, the incarnate word, in order to find assurance, individuals are summoned to seek the enabling power of a new inward principle in order to find assurance or even the warrant to believe the gospel. Although this may not have been the explicit teaching of Reformed theologians who articulated a distinction between effectual calling and regeneration, it does seem like an inevitable implication. And Spurgeon addressed this issue. Um, seems to have covered all the bases. <laughs> um, well, it, it, he deals with it in a somewhat indirect way. Spurgeon encountered the problem of troubled sinners complaining about the warrant to believe in the gospel, stating that unless they were sure of God's work in their life, they did not have the right to believe on Christ. And Ian Murray explains... That a work of God in the heart is necessary in order that a sinner comes to faith, Spurgeon never doubted. On the contrary, he preached it clearly. But it is not with that work that the sinner is to be concerned. His attention is to be fixed on the warrant, on Christ. God has much to do in us, but requires nothing of us before we come to Christ. The way to faith and the warrant of faith are not the same things. Sinners, says Owen, are not directed first to secure their souls that they are born again and then afterwards to believe, but they are first to believe that the remission of sin has been tendered to them in the blood of Christ. Nor is it the duty of men to question whether they have faith or not, but actually to believe. And faith in its operations will evidence itself. So do you see then how this separation of these things, um, an idea that the Spirit can somehow work apart from the Word, um, shifts the focus and ultimately affects assurance. It also, I think, informs the way that we evangelize. Um, you know, I, I, the gospel is the power of God to salvation. And um, it is a mystery. But... <laughs> 
uh, we preach the gospel and we trust that uh, the Spirit of God is going to use that in those whom he wills. And we don't um, look to any other sort of secret working or, uh, you know, the Spirit working completely independently from the, the preaching of the gospel. We preach the gospel. And it's the power of God to salvation. And uh, he will uh, effectually call some through it and regenerate them. Um, so, you, you know, you may think, what in the world is Gardner off on this thing? Um, when, we, when we go through this lesson in, in uh, the essentials class, I mean, we, we go through effectual call in about five minutes. You know, uh, it's just sort of stated as fact. Um, but it's worthy of much more careful thought and consideration and meditation. And um, I've just really been struck in, you know, in, in thinking about this, about the, the and just the enormity of the reality that God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, you know, focused this work in me. Um, and then you. And it's just an amazing thing to think about that we were predestined and called, justified, being sanctified, will be glorified. Through no merit of our own. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for these glorious truths and just the marvel of um, your work in us. We are just sinners and we bring nothing to you except our praise and thanksgiving. Um, Lord, we hope that as we think about these things, we will uh, love you and glorify you all the more. In Jesus' name, amen.